Okay, hi everyone. Um, this is a continuation of the In Conversation with event series, which is organised and run by the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport's Next Generation Forum. Um, I am very pleased to welcome both, correct me if I'm wrong in saying Shay. Yeah, that's correct. Lovely. Welcoming Shay from Travis Perkins, who is our interviewer for the day, and um, Phil Rowe from Logistics UK, who is our interviewee. A um, little bit about the Next Generation Forum before we get stuck in. If you're unfamiliar with the forum, our aims are very much to support the career development of people considering a career in the sector, establishing those, those careers or looking to move into a career in logistics or transport. Um, we really want to make logistics, transport and supply chain accessible to people, whatever their backgrounds or beliefs. And we want to make a coordinated diversity and inclusion approach as well. Um, our chair of the forum, Oliver Craig, uh, working at Network Rail on the redesign of Euston, which is an amazing project. Um, it's always welcome, uh, always happy for people to get in touch. And you may notice the difference in age between Shay and I. I am not a member of the forum. I am the supporter of the forum at the Chartered Institute. So any questions, please do direct them our way. But otherwise, it's over to Shay to put Phil through his paces. Any questions that you've got, please do um, pop them in the chat. And welcome both. Over to you. Hello, Hi, Phil. Nice to meet you. Hey, Jay, how are you doing? Really good, thank you. Just um, got off a train. All oh, right, <laughs> you did well then. Um, so firstly, why are you passionate about inspiring the next generation of logistics and supply chain professionals? I think probably for, for two reasons. Um, I, think, I think logistics and supply chain offers a great career. I've certainly, um, for, the largest, for the largest part, enjoyed, um, enjoyed my career since I left university in 1987 when everything was still black and white. Um, and so I think, I think it's a great, there's great variety for uh, people to enjoy. Yep. There's, there's room for, um, in the, you know, I'd say logistics is a team game uh, and there's room for everybody in that team. Um, it, it doesn't matter what your level of ac academic achievement or educational achievement has been. Um, there's actually superb opportunities for people uh, to progress and have a have a great time. So I think that's probably the the micro reason, but I think the macro reason as well um, is that is that everything is everything that we do is supported by logistics and supply chain. Yeah. Um, so there's just a great purpose um, to to what what we do. You know, there, there wouldn't. I mean, you know, that came out quite a bit during um covid but it's actually always been there um and whether it whether it's dealing with things that people just like to have or whether it's providing things that people must have yeah. um you know there's a great purpose to it so so we need to have a strong and healthy uh logistics profession otherwise we won't have a strong and healthy economy yeah yeah i totally agree and it's you know, for me personally, it's been a brilliant career so far. I've loved it. Any of it. Um, so what is your current role and focus? Um, so I, I'm i now a president of Logistics UK, which sounds very grandiose, and it's a bit of an old title, really. But um, I Logistics UK is a trade association, so it represents 19,000 members working in the supply chain and logistics industry. Um, and we represent their interests uh, to government um, uh, by way of policy and lobby. We also work with government on understanding what they want to understand more of, because often they they need organisations like like us to be able to do that. We're the largest of the um, fifty odd um, trade associations that operate in the broad. Um, logistics area, uh, but we represent all different modes in logistics, whether it's road, rail, sea, or air. We represent people who buy and own the goods. Um, uh, so you know, you're, you're at Travis, aren't you? I think, if I remember rightly. So, so Travis, Travis, remember. Um, but also, we represent organisations that operate and provide those services. So, um, I've been there since been there since April. 
Um, and it's a uh, part-time job because I, I actually took early retirement from DHL where I was, where I'd been working for a few years um, in February. Um, I'm also a, um, I'm also a non-exec member of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport Board. I've uh, been here for about five years now, um, working with Sharon and before that with, um, with Kevin. Been a member of the Chartered Institute forever, really, um, as long as I can, as long as I can remember. Um, and in addition to that, I work as a um, an hourly paid lecturer at Coventry University. Um, live there, I think. Yeah, you've been there, have you? Yeah, yeah, I used to live there. Oh, right, okay, good stuff. Well, I don't do any lecturing, thank God, um, but I help students, MBA students, with their projects. Um, so they have to project in there in their sort of final year and so I work with six students at a time uh, doing that so yeah it's a mix of stuff but generally generally all around logistics and business. Brilliant thank you so can you take us on a journey on how you got to where you are today? Wow well, uh, that's uh oh God, and this is being recorded as well isn't it? So, <laughs> um, so I, I left university in 87 went to Salford did an economics degree um, and in my, when I was doing my degree, there's a lot of economics, which was pretty dull, to be honest. Um, but there was some bits of it that were super interesting. I did a, I did a, a module in transport economics and one in industrial economics as well. Um, and uh, I uh, very much encouraged to look at working in the logistics industry. So I only applied for two jobs, applied for one with a company called the NFC, which doesn't exist anymore, is now DHL uh, and the co-op. Uh, both working in logistics and I, I got lucky enough to get the NFC one and I joined there as a management trainee, did that for a year, uh, stayed there for four years, um, working in frozen food my uh, yeah, across the for bird's eye walls and then for Mars. So my, my only claim to fame really in that period was that I managed to launch a Mars ice cream um, in, 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 in the UK uh, in, uh, in whenever that was, 1990, something like that. Um, and I, um, I really enjoyed that. There was it was a great graduate course. There were sixty four of us yeah. um, that that year. Um, I still know two or three other people um, from from that uh, from that course, and it was a great um, it was a great kickoff actually um, into uh, into working in in the industry. Um, I, I got a bit I don't know I got a bit frustrated I suppose, and I ended up moving. Um, moving company and worked to went to a company called TDG, which is now GXO. So I only actually ever worked for two companies um, to manage the Sain Sainsbury's Beers, Wines and Spirits um, right. supply chain in the UK, which is a, one of the best jobs I've ever had. Imagine 18,000 pallets of booze, mainly wine, uh, uh, all in a big, uh, all in a big bonded warehouse. So I really enjoyed, really enjoyed that. And then I carried on doing operational roles. So I, I went and ran a big automated warehouse for Cadbury, um, as was uh, Mondelez now, um, for a few years. And then I, I guess after, I think I've been doing op operational roles probably for about 12 years. Um, and I, I wanted to do something different. Um, and, and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my hand at something. So I, I, I persuaded... Um, uh, a guy who, who was working with to take me on as a uh, into a business development role, um, and I, I went and and through and did my, uh, sales and account management um, and a bit of consulting uh, wow. for this guy. It was great. I really enjoyed it. it was, honestly, it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, that, then I um, was fortunate enough to be promote uh, to be approached by um, Excel as was. Well became DHL the next year and I, I so I rejoined Excel in 2004 right. um, to run their industrial uh, about half rather of their industrial business um, spent five years um, run as managing director of a, of a pretty small business unit dealing with people like Network Rail, National Grid, uh, we started a business in agriculture um, and that was all, all about running multiple customers, multiple operations, profit and loss, um, customer service, renegotiations, sales. And that, that's, the, that's the bit that really, I think, has kept me going in logistics all these years is the variety of things 
that yeah. you, can, you can get involved in. Um, ended up, uh, one of my customers grew and grew and grew. And, and so I, I did some international um, management of accounts with British American Tobacco all over the world. Um, and that was that was re really good. Did some product development stuff in there as well. And then 10 years ago, um, I, I was asked to take on a different project. So uh, we, there was a team of people put together uh, working for a great guy called Tim Slater um, to look at the whole transport strategy for, for DHL. Um, so uh, we, we went and did that with, with a great, great group of people. Um, fantastic team. Um, did that for five years, took over as MD of the transport business in 2016 and became a board member at, um, at, at DHL Supply Chain. Um, and I stayed in, stayed in, on the board until I retired um, at the end of February, but I did three different jobs, um, manager director of the transport business. And then um, I took over after the um, problems that we had with the KFC, I took over as chief operations officer um, for, for a period of time. So I was looking after all things like project management and health and safety um, and quality um, and innovation um, and digitalization as well. Um, and then I was asked um, to take over as chief customer officer, which I did for uh, the two years or so before, a bit more than that actually before I finished, which was sales marketing solution design. Um, so I, I, I regard myself to have been tremendously fortunate, actually. Yeah, that was sort of my That's next point. Variety. Would you say that your career followed the path that you expected when you initially got into it? No, not really. I don't think you know. Yeah, I, I applied for the job at NFC when I was at Salford because they had this um, leaf, they had this like pamphlet or brochure rather in the careers place, which said, "Do you want to be running your own business in two years?" Yeah, I thought that sounded all right. Um, <laughs> at the time, it was an employee-owned business. Yeah. Um, so when you joined, they gave you two hundred shares. Wow. Um, and I thought, well, that's, actually, that, that's that, I like that. I like the sound of that. And that's why that's why I um, I joined. Um, and they, you know, they were pretty true to that, really. Um, and then, I guess when I, when I've fallen out of love of whatever I was doing at the time, there's always been something else to go to yeah and sink your teeth into sort of thing yeah so I, I don't think um yeah I would I wanted to be a director by the time I was 30 but that was more ego than anything else um, oh God. <laughs> I, want, I want the same thing <laughs> <laughs> um so I couldn't give you I couldn't give you a logical rationale for that apart from just a bit of ego, <laughs> you know? um but um but the the most brilliant thing about working is as you get to work in great teams and I've been so yeah lucky to have brilliant bosses largely um to have uh, and to be working alongside you know brilliant people it's it, it's not logistics is not a game for people who don't like working in teams yeah yeah definitely um so what do you see as the most challenging part of your career so far um i guess i guess um with logistics you're you're always um you're you're always as good or as bad as your recent performance um so and that that doesn't it doesn't matter then whether you're talking about people who work for a contractor or running house operations or or anything none, none of that it's not about who you work for it's about what you're responsible for and and what you're responsible for ultimately is meeting those consumer needs ultimately through through the supply chain and when when things go well it's brilliant and people generally say well it should go well shouldn't it and when things go wrong then people tend to uh, that tends to be a, a, a bit a bit outrage and you know working in the industry yourself that you you know when things are going well and you also know when things are about to go wrong and that yeah. having the resilience to deal with those kind of periods because it happens to everybody yeah. Um, and, and I'm sure it happens to people in other careers as well. I just don't know. I've never done them. Um, but, but actually having the resilience and the teamwork to stick together and, and get through those difficult periods is probably, probably, the, uh, probably the hardest thing. Um, but 
the only thing I'd say is ultimately you do. Um, yep. And uh, and everyone has periods like that, I think, in their uh, in their career. Do you have any stress management techniques you use and during those <laughs> tough periods? Um, I guess I started. I, I, I remember. I can't remember who it was who told me. I think it was some. It was um, one of the senior team at Network Rail actually, who said, "What you need to do is you need to get you need to get a hobby that you can't think about work while you're doing it." That sounds like a good idea, to be honest. <laughs> and, and, and actually, I thought yeah, that's, that's not that's not a bad idea. Yeah. Um, so so I've I've done two or three things that are like that, whether it's playing a musical instrument or whether it's learning to learning to dance or something like something that is completely alien to me, to be honest, in both counts. Um, but actually, something that is a hobby, but you can concentrate on it, and it yes. gives you something else as well. Because I think mean, one of the one of the risks in uh in in logistics is that you become too um focused upon it too obsessed with it you have to have things yeah. that, that matter to you as much um outside outside as well um so i guess that would be one of them i'm sure people who know me would say it was nothing quite that um quite that planned or calm really um but uh but but that's but that's one of the best one of the you know good bits of advice that that I, I'd I'd received because um, other things you do, your mind wanders, doesn't it? And you go back to work anyway. Yeah, yeah, I have the same problem. Like if I'm cooking food, for example, then my mind will be thinking about these emails or these tasks that I've got to get done. Whereas um, when I go to the gym, then you know my mind's clear, sort of thing. Yeah, well, that's good for you, mate. You need, you do need those sort of balancing things in your life, though. I think. Yeah. So what has been the highlight of your career so far? Well, they, they, I did a, a focus interview um, a couple of months ago, and, and it's quite a tricky one, actually. Um, we, we, um, when I was with uh, the, the industrial team in, in DHL, we, were, we, we went absolutely um, full out as a team to win um, a couple of contracts with the, um, on the Olympics to... Oh to work with the team that were building all the venues, managing the security, managing the consolidation uh, of goods as well. And we, we won that. Um, I can remember that day we were in, um, it was a bit like the apprentice actually. We were in, we were in a, in Canary Wharf with this fantastic view down the Thames, you know, and we're doing this presentation and there's an army of people um, in, in this room and, and there was uh, me and Tim and John and, and uh, Jonathan there doing this doing this presentation and um, and we came out of it and we just thought we'd won it we just thought we'd got it yeah um, it just felt brilliant um, and we did get it and then we ran those we ran those sites all the way up to uh, the start of the games um, and. That was brilliant to be part of that. We yeah. also put, when the games, were, games were running, we put a couple, we put two or three guys uh, into Transport for London um, to to do the re relationship with the industry on roads and all the rest of it around there. So I think that was probably the best bit, really. Yeah, um, that yeah, was, that's, that was, that's a bit I'm proud of actually. Yeah, it's literally history. Yeah. Um. So what activities outside of just your day-to-day -day role do you think have contributed most to your career um well i think um we we did a great um program within or dhl introduced a great program globally called certified which was really around um teamwork um at, at skills um and uh engagement um and a number of us or loads and loads of people actually within within the DHL management team all the way right to the top and right right all the way down and we're engaged in that both going, going through the programs but then also delivering the programs afterwards and that was brilliant that was really really good um as a, a way of sort of broadening um people's right my horizons and, and takes you out of your day-to-day -day silo also done a lot of career mentoring for people over the years um, and that's been been good it doesn't work every time sometimes you click sometimes you don't yeah. um, but actually I've, I've you know really enjoyed um really enjoyed um doing doing that and also receiving it i mean i i had um 
I had a, a, a mentor for about the last 15 years of my career, um, external mentor, actually nothing, never worked in logistics in his life. Wow. Um, runs, runs a farm at the moment, in, in Devon at the minute. Uh, but he was absolutely fantastic uh, because it was somebody that, uh, particularly as I was starting to do a few more kind of senior roles, um, that you could that I could talk to and think, think things through um, that wasn't in in the workplace wasn't you know it wasn't in the, in the line and, and that was that was great um, but I think probably the biggest thing that supported me was actually the people that I work for yeah um, so throughout those those years you know, there's been half a dozen people that were just brilliant for me um, supported me put me back online when I was when I was out of line uh, yeah. as well. Um, and, you know, I look, I look back on, on the people that, that really supported me through, through those, uh, through that period. And uh, yeah, they're the people I'm really grateful to. Thank you. Um, do you think it's important that next generation members make use of volunteering opportunities? Yeah, I think as long as the, as long as you're comfortable doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you if you're doing it because you feel you have to do it or you, you should do it, but your heart isn't in it, I think yeah. people would notice that. Um, and you know, people people are very good at spotting insincerity. Yeah. Um, and by the same token, they're also really, really pleased when people come and talk to them and, and, and ask questions and answer questions and all that sort of stuff. So I, I think, yes, if your heart's in it. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, working in logistics is pretty intense, isn't it? We all know it's, yeah. it's got lots of pull on your time. So, you know, my only other bit of advice is don't take on too, too much that you can't do it. Yeah. Um, because having started to do something, if you then, can't do it for for perfectly legit reasons it's pretty dispiriting for the other person i think yeah um so yeah that that, that would be my view i think um obviously within the industry at the moment there's quite a big problem with skills gaps yeah um do you think that the industry itself is doing enough to you know try and mitigate those and um, if not what do you think they could do well, I think it's highly variable. Yeah, I think there's a lot of organisations that do fantastic work, actually, on, on skills, both recruiting skills, but probably even more importantly, um, giving giving skills, giving opportunity. You know, one of, one, of the, one of the great things about working in logistics is that people, who say, of all sorts of different educational backgrounds can advance their career really, really well. Yeah. Um, and I always tell the story of a guy who worked for me Started as a, an agency worker, ended up running, um, uh, ended up running as managing director, part of our, our business in Southeast Asia. Yeah, and over over ten over ten twelve year period, um, and so I think there's lots of recognition of people. I think what there hasn't been has been the logistics industry as a whole putting itself forward, and that's why we've put together this campaign that you may have seen called Generation Logistics, um, which is a deliberate attempt by the Charter Institute of Logistics working together with Logistics UK and the government to attract people, make them curious to what working in logistics is really like. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was really pleased when we were able to get that started at Easter this year. We launched in August, um, you know, and even, even in the, first couple of even in the first month or so where it's been heavily disrupted with 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 the period of national mourning and, and the change of government and all the rest of it you know we've we've had 160,000 people engage with our social media campaign already and I think we're going to need to keep doing that and keep doing it more because unfortunately logistics is a bit of a hidden yeah I, I totally agree and we've we can't allow it to be otherwise we won't get our fair share of of uh, great people going forward yeah i mean for me personally i didn't realize the opportunities available to me in logistics and supply chain and since i've joined the industry it's been amazing i've had great opportunities to speak to all different sorts of people and i think that you know within tp we're going 
into schools now to speak yeah. about supply chain and logistics because it is such a good career and because of their skill gaps. Yeah, have a look at have a look at the generation logistics stuff. We're we're trying to we're trying to do the piece piece that's way before anything like recruitment. That's really about just awareness. Yeah. So we're we're, we're trying to get six hundred thousand people that are new to logistics aware of the opportunities engaged with uh, the website hub that we've built um, over the first year and we've got um, we've got the dft um, uh, partly funding that we've got 27 um, logistics organizations but i mean real household names asda amazon tesco the all the big contractors siva dhl gxo etc cetera, etc cetera. but also um, consultancies and it companies and small and some of the smaller um, some regional players people like you know europa and and um, brussels and malcolm's up in up in up in scotland all supporting the campaign with with active sponsorship um and i, I think that's because we've realized that in the circumstances that the uk has at the moment we have to get yeah. out there and fight for talent thank you um so what are your top three pieces of advice <laughs> <about the career. laughs> I'll give you one already, which was that stuff about having a hobby that you can uh, that, yep. that keeps you keeps your head free from from work. Um, I, I guess the other one would be get uh, uh, get variety in your experience early in your career. Um, uh, I although I did mainly operational roles in my first ten years, I also did some commercial roles and solution design. Um, roles and uh, some uh, sales support and account management in that time, and and I think it, it it the reason why I think it that's useful is it gives you variety, and it gives you the opportunity to find out what you like. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and also perhaps what you don't like. Yeah, um, uh, as well. Um, so I think that's um, I think that's really you know really useful then. For you to, to, to you know, as you get through into your into your into your sort of thirties, to figure out really what you want to do um, okay. uh, as you go forward. Um, what would the third one be? I guess it's about team. Uh, you, you you can be in lots of different teams simultaneously. Yeah, which means that you might be leading one team. But you might be a team player or team member in another, um, and um, so actually, Belbin is very good at, uh, at this. It's a bit probably a bit old fashioned now, but they talks about team roles and and what what role people play in in an effective team. And I always think that understanding that was really useful, um, and so that you can both so that you can consciously just. Um, shift your contribution to whatever is appropriate for the team that you're in you know you don't want a team that's got five chairmen and, and no and no team players and then nothing will get done you, you, by the same token you, you you you've got to have leadership within a team as well but you you've um you need a combination of those skills to make it effective um yeah that that would be uh, that would be the other one. If you want a final one, it's keeps try and keep a sense of humour. <laughs> yeah. Not always easy. I, Not I easy. get told off for my sense of humour sometimes. <laughs> uh, okay, well, okay. I, I, I won't. Uh, I won't inquire. Um, but that that you know, yeah. thing you will have. There will be difficult times, but but you will get through them. And um, you know, trying uh, in 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 to to maintain that balance is very difficult to do and i haven't certainly i've not always done it by any stretch of the imagination um but yeah it's uh, quite good if you can so if you could go back to a young you <laughs> what what would you tell yourself what advice would you give yourself that's a tough one i think um I, th I think for me, making the move out of operations and into other areas right. was re was a real. I, I'd I'd got myself in a in, in a headspace which said the only way you can be successful in this industry is to be an operator. 
yeah that's that's the only way so that's the the, the, the prime job that's the only way you can do it and it's just not the case yeah um, there's lots of different ways to be uh, successful and have fulfilling careers within logistics and I don't I don't think I realized that early enough um, actually you've got to have I think a good comprehension and understanding of operations but it doesn't mean you have to do it all your life yeah. Um, so yeah that, that's a bit I, would, I look back on now I think I probably you know I probably should have made that change maybe three or four years earlier um, so are there any sort of personal development activities you did within your yeah, work that, that helped to boost your career yeah I mean that that was um, I have to take my hat off to both XL and DHL that is something they are they are absolutely brilliant at and I don't get me wrong. I learned a huge amount when I was when I was working for for TDG, and that that really sort of made me um, made me capable of going into more senior roles. But the personal development stuff within, um, you know, that ha- uh, permitting me to have an external mentor, um, yeah. r- running through t- a number of different um, programs, whether it's certified or whether it's some, whether it's some of the other stuff were absolutely brilliant and. You know, they, they um, the investment in um, investment in in people was 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 excellent in my in my experience in in the whole industry. It's in, it's interesting. We're actually there's a, a report that came out about four or five months ago that Amazon did with Logistics UK um, called, uh, about logistics and its role in growth of the economy and leveling up. And it's a really interesting paper. You can get it, it's, you can download it for nothing off the uh, Logistics UK website. And it's really interesting because it talks about all of the, uh, all of the advancement that's ha- that happens within logistics. There's a survey they did, for example, of young managers uh, going, uh, sorry, young, not just managers, young recruits into logistics. I think yeah. 70% of them said they'd had really good initial training and that they thought that training would be great for them in in their future career yeah i feel the same uh, i've learned yeah. so much you know i think so yeah no it's it's been my experience has been positive all, all, all the way all the way through really um that's all the questions that i have okay good stuff thank you good well done good job thank you so i was um wondering if anyone in the room had any questions at all this is where we have to brave the silence you know you see, Phil knows how much I hate braving a silence. We are often in meetings together where we do brave said silences. We have got some questions coming through in the chat. Um, just checking, Che, that you can see those. Um, if not, I shall read them out. Yep, I can see them. See oh, right. I shall leave those to you then. Okay. Um, so we've had a question from Rebecca Hawkins. Did you ever feel the need to do an MBA or further higher education? Do you know, I thought about it. I remember um, I'd be about, when was I? I went to an MBA fair when I was about 26. Um, and um, it was just after I was, um, just after I'd, I moved um, job, actually. Um, and, I, and I went there and, and it was really interesting, but it was also really stuffy. I'm very financially orientated and, and I, I didn't fancy it at the time, but I always had this little thing inside me saying, you should have done that. You should have done that. And I, I went and did a mini MBA right. back at Salford, actually, uh, where I did my, um, where I did my degree. Um, and it, it was, it was like a teaser and it, as to whether, you, whether, whether this was for you. And I really, really enjoyed it, particularly had great things in it, like digital marketing right. uh, in particular, but you know what? And, and I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, because obviously I'm, I'm acting as a project supervisor now for MBA students. And I, I'm not so sure I ever really missed out by by uh, by not doing it, actually. Uh, um, See, I was thinking about it in, in my career as well. So it's really interesting to hear that, actually, because I, I wasn't sure whether it is something that I'd want to do or not. I, chain. I, I, I mean there's lots of master's education out there that is perhaps a bit more um targeted around particular areas. you can do great mscs in, in 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 logistics for example i think that would have been really interesting i think i would have enjoyed that um but uh no i don't i don't i don't regret not doing it 
Um, we've had a question from Murtazar. I'm sorry if I've said that name wrong. Um, what is your point of view on teaching logistics? What universities should teach logistics MSc students right now? Well, I, I mean, I don't know enough about the university sector to know who should or who shouldn't. Um, I do think that what's more probably important that, uh, you, than the university part of it is that we should be putting logistics as a subject matter within subjects through school. Yeah. You know, there's a great fit with maths. There's a great fit with geography. Yeah, there's there's a there's actually a really a really good fit with with English as well. You know, if you think about the the specialist subjects that people do, whether it's and they do them early. My wife's a primary school teacher, and 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 they they do they do it there. But especially, I think in secondary school, we need to get logistics into the uh, curriculum. Yeah. Probably probably not as a subject matter in its own, but certainly as uh, as an area within subjects and then I think we would get more demand and then we would get more universities doing logistics because they would see more demand for it yeah yeah I, I completely agree I wish that within school I learned about it because I feel like if I realized the complexities and everything that's involved I would have definitely went straight into it um we've had a question from Stephanie Ezra um as a supply chain and logistics is such a fast field, how would you suggest a newbie to learn about the nicks and crannies to know which, uh, what area one would like to get involved in and become an expert with time? Yeah, I, I think this goes back to, to having variety. I mean, the, the graduate program that, that I did all those years ago um, was brilliant. You know, it was absolutely brilliant. And I know that there's really good graduate programs and very good apprenticeships that run now. But the reason why it was so good was because it gave um, it gave new entrants into the industry a bit of exposure of lots of different things. So we did solution design, we did marketing, we did negotiating with unions, for example. We did finance. Um, and, and so you're able to try your hand at, yeah. at, at many different things. And, and then I think if you're with with an employer that's so minded that 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 encourages you to seek out variety i you know i'd really i'd really that that's that that's the route that, that that i would take i also think you might not get the answer to that question very very quickly yeah that it might be that might be a you know a five six seven year question yeah but as long as you've got areas to advance in or areas to to move into to try i don't think that should be a bad thing yeah. Um, we've had another question from Stephanie, who asked, how would you attract people to logistics compared to transport planning? Um, well, I, I, I mean, first of all, for me, logistics is a very, very broad church. Yeah. So if I if I look at the people, for example, that are working with us on generation logistics, we have network rail, we have national highways um, that are sitting inside our uh, sponsoring organizations and when we looked at the different roles that exist it, to me they're all logistics yeah um and and so i would i would say logistics is a very broad church and the way that i would we're trying to attract people in is to make people aware of the breadth of the different roles different opportunities that exist yeah most people at the moment when they think about logistics think about lorry driving and when they think about lorry driving, they think about people sleeping in the cabs. But it's and, and as critical as those people are who do those jobs, it's a very small proportion of the number of people that actually work in logistics. Um, so um, what, what I would try and do is um, is to show the breadth of, of opportunity and, and encourage them to try both. When I um, when I started work, um, they sent me to Scotland in my and I must have upset somebody. I think sent, sent me up to Bell's Hill in my second week. Um, the first big project I did was transport planning, the supermarkets in Scotland for, for frozen food. Um, and actually, things, they, they just stay with you, those kind of experiences. Yeah. And they make you, they make you better at getting variety and of, of experience just makes you a much better, um, a much better career prospect for people. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do myself is try and get a broad spectrum of knowledge so then I can hopefully focus down one path after that. 
Yeah. Um, we've had a question from Mantas. How important would you say networking is? Uh, I think it. I think it becomes increasingly important. Right. Um, you know, I said right at the start that there's still some people that I did my management training program with. Um, I still see. But having said that, I can't think that I was in touch with them all the way through my career. Yeah. Um, however, I think as you progress into middle to senior management roles, it becomes much more important. Okay. Um, because then you want you get a variety of viewpoint um, and, and you also become known yourself. Okay. Um, you, can't, you can't network your way to a career if you haven't got the skills attributes and success yeah but if you've got those things networking then really does boost your career so i, I think it's i think it's really important but more so as you progress into uh, into middle and senior management roles what would be some of your tips for networking um well i i, I mean i would say this wouldn't i but i would use the trade associations and the institute yeah um and i would uh, i think and, and I would use them not just in a sense of networking for, for, for its own sense, but also being involved in subject matters that you're interested in. Um, because there's nothing like there's nothing like having something in common with other people when you're talking through something for networking to make it to make it work. And also you understand each other better when you when you when it relates to uh, something that you're both you're both interested in. So I think they're great. Um, they're great opportunities. Um, I think judicious use of LinkedIn works, yeah. but don't don't you know don't don't connect with the known universe um, because that just looks silly. I can be a bit guilty of that myself. I'm not going to yeah, lie. It's, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? But, um, but um, again, purpose is is what I, what I would give to that. Um, but also, don't forget within your own organisation. Um, and and taking those taking those those opportunities, you know, particularly as you go into more senior roles, um, most of those roles are not appointed by one person just on their own. They're, they'll probably be appointed by a team of people, um, or, or there will certainly um, be conversations about candidates. So being known within the organisation that you want to that you you're trying to move up within is is quite important. Thank you very much. Um, we've had a question from Charlotte that asked, do you think the logistics industry will change much over the next five, 10 and 20 years? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's constantly changing. It, it, it's constantly changing and it will continue to change. But I think the bit that doesn't really change, it goes back to that purpose. So what, what does tend to change over time is how things are done. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you know, if I if I think back to my own career, um, when I was in my 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 sort of twenties, um, we would have many more layers of, of of management than we have now. You know, um, I remember I yeah, this shows how old I am really. But I'd never used a spreadsheet until I started work. Yeah, so the tools and the methods and the um, possible possible ways of of operating constantly constantly change but the thing that the thing that makes that work is the desire to improve you yeah know, that, that's a feature of people that work in logistics in my view they want they they're, they're open to things changing yeah. and becoming better yeah and that's driven by the purpose isn't it you, you want to be you want to be able to provide what people want you want to be able to do it at best efficient efficient yeah. cost you want to be able to do it in a way that people want to work with you and your organization to do so those underlying principles engagement efficiency improvement service you know i, th I think they 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 don't change yeah yeah but but all the things around it about how we do things yeah. what we like. can do, do change like the driverless vehicles, for example, I guess would that be one of them? Yeah, and you know that 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 that'll be here in some form or another. Um, I'm not quite sure. I believe the people that think that that um, that that will be 
uh, a massive um, majority of, of vehicles on the road for it because I don't think it will be. But but actually, what will happen is as the technology develops, people will figure out how best to exploit it, uh, and what the best solutions are going forward against those principles, uh, and then there'll be adoption and change. And you know, you've, you've seen that you see that in logistics all the time. Yeah. Um, we've had a further question from Manpreet. What role did you find the hardest and challenging and how did you overcome it? Uh, probably the most difficult time I had was when I was running the automated warehouse for, for Cadbury. Um, that didn't go well for me. Um, we ran a big project, which ultimately was very successful, but wasn't particularly successful when I was there. Um, and so that was personally quite painful. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, for, for me, and you know, I was very fortunate. That's a really great team there and really good guy that, that actually took over from me. But I had to move away from that. Um, and that was the right decision for me, but it was also the right decision for the project as well. Um, a question from Tim. Where do you see logistics and automated driving and the impact on drivers in the future? I, I, um, I mean, this is this is a don't, don't I, I wouldn't I wouldn't ask you to place your bets on what I'm going to say now, but I'll give you my I'll give you my best view. Um, <laughs> I think what we'll see with automated drive driving vehicles is I think we'll see yards converted first um, because it's the most dangerous place. Yeah. Um, within within, within the, the the physical supply chain, um, it's also needs to run twenty four seven. So it, it it's a really important uh, getting the flow of yard movements right keeps your warehouse moving and all the rest of it. So I, I personally think we'll see that first. I think yeah. we'll probably see maybe the same sort of functionality used at big delivery points for the same for the same reasons. And then I think we'll see assisted driving on um, on on uh, major roads. But I think that the, the reason why I don't think we'll see not not for a few years anyway, why I don't think we'll see wholesale change is because drivers do so many other things as well. Yeah. Um, and that interaction at, at at the delivery point, the health and safety part of what we do, the fact that. You know, all the vast majority of our of our vehicle journeys don't just run on motorways and A roads. You know, they will run on 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 some minor roads of some description. Yeah. So I, I think we'll see more assisted technology for drivers, and then I think in those areas we'll we'll see that see that expand. Um, but I mean, driving driving a vehicle now compared with what it was twenty years ago, it's a, it's a world of difference. I mean, they are. Um, they are real marvelous pieces of modern technology, um, and actually, that's one of the messages we haven't really got out there yet. Thank you. We've got a question from Rebecca. Have you ever taken a role and then felt out of your depth? How yeah. did you manage that? <laughs> I don't regret it, but I do. I did, I did. <laughs> First time I ever got a general manager's role, which was the Sainsbury's Sainsbury's role when I was. Would it be 24, 25, something like that? Uh, 25. Um, yeah, I mean, totally out of my depth. Absolutely hopeless in truth for the first six months to a year. Um, I, 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 um, I wasn't, I thought I was, but I actually wasn't experienced enough to take that job on. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think I didn't realise that probably for a year so I, I really you, you really focus on 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 the, the short-term achievements um and getting through and being able to um and being able to to focus on the short term of what matters but I think I remember I, I'd, I'd been in the job for about uh seven months seven or eight months I think and I hadn't had any holiday um, and I, and I, I took a holiday in the in the in, the, in February, February '92, I think it was. And um, and I, I sat there and I thought, my God, you don't really know what you're doing here, do you? And I just sought help really, and you yeah. know, I'd got two or three people that that supported me, and and a boss who who was quite hard, but actually very fair, and and actually helped me a great great deal. Um, 
and um, a guy called John Fall, and um, and and that's how I got through it. And and three year, and and two years after that, we won the Depot of the Year award for the company that I was working for the for at, uh, at the time, and that was that 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 was that was just brilliant. That was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Um. So I've had a, another question from Mantas. As you get higher up the career ladder, would you say it becomes easier or harder to manage work-life balance? Harder. And the reason for it is because you have many more calls on your time and on your calendar. And that was particularly true when I was doing the sales roles where, I mean, this is all pre-COVID, but but where you're where you're out and about a lot, you're seeing a lot of different people, either because you're seeing customers in the case of a sales role, or maybe you're you're running uh, a business unit that has multiple sites. You have to be visible. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be um, to, to a large degree. You have to be out and about. Even in these days of Zoom and Teams, I still think that's true. Um, and so therefore you're juggling a lot more, a, a lot more demands. Um, so yeah, I, I would say it gets harder. Yeah. Um, so Jim asked, what is next for you? Um, well, I, I, I was, I, I retired on the basis that I might work a couple of days a week, but that doesn't seem to be quite, I'm going to, uh, working out at the minute because, okay. uh, with jet, which is great really because of the generation logistics stuff. So, um, I, I want to try and, and, and keep, and keep the, uh, the balance. I, I, um, agreed to uh, the Logistics UK role, which is like a non-exec chair, which is a non-exec chair, um, for three years. Um, and I'll carry on. I've just, I've just signed up for Coventry Uni to uh, do um, uh, helping with students. I'm going to help some overseas students this time, actually, um, for, the, for, for running through next year. Just been co-opted as a, a CILT board member for, um, for another year. Um, so I guess as I look forward now, I see um, I see more of the same. I don't really want to do many other things. Actually, I, if I do, there'll be more more in my private life, or, or maybe doing a non-exec directorship in something completely different. Yeah. I looked at one the other day, which was a um, which was a, like an archaeology organisation. We saw its history of some level. So I thought, how oh, fancy doing that? I don't, they'd never take me because I've got no. no no interest to call it well i've got interest but i've got no qualifications but anyway so i i i i think i'm more than happy with uh, with 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 what i've got um and uh i, I think get i haven't quite got the balance right yet yeah um but 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 i will do um but by the same token you know i'll be 57 in march I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not in pipe and slippers territory just yet. <laughs> um, Tim also asked, "How would you describe your style of management then and now, and what's the best guidance on characteristics of a leader?" Oh, cracky! That's a that's a that's a that's an hour long question of its own, isn't it? Really. <laughs> um, when it, when I go back to that training program that I did when I first joined, first started work. One of the big um, principles behind the NFC was a style of management called consultative. Yeah, this, I mean, there's about half a dozen or so styles of management. I think seven actually is when, when the last development program I went on. But I've always believed that consultative management is the desirable one because everyone has a right to be heard. Yeah. The... The, the team responsibility piece that goes with that is that then teams have a responsibility to each other to follow the decision that is made. Okay. And, and that I think is the essence of, of, a, of consultative management. Now, it is not always possible, and I don't think it's also always desirable just to have one style of management. Um, but I would hope that people would describe me as as, as having predominantly that that approach. Um, it, it's um, it's certainly how I would want to be managed. Who would want to work in a team where no one listens to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, nobody's going to do that. I think for any any amount of time. 
um this is from me do, do you have any books that you've you know read that really helped to uh, build up your knowledge or help your career yeah well, I'm probably I, I mean I, I've got loads of them but you know the, the honest truth is I've probably not read most of the ones that I've got yeah bit of a sort of late night late night Amazon purchase and then you get it and you think what about that for but um a couple that I have read and have used um I think that the whole good to great work which is quite old now um that that was actually how do you move from being a good organization to being a great organization I think was very very powerful and I think remains powerful uh now and, and I would but I would recommend that. Um, some of the examples are a bit, maybe a little bit dated now, but I, I think that was really good. Um, there's a book called Blue Ocean Strategy, which I always found really, really good as well. Um, but I think most of the most of the of the things you can learn come from interaction, your interactions with people. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's there's a lot of Oh God, I mean, how many management books are there? there must be thousands. Yeah, I've got a few. <laughs> um, but the the ones that we, the one that we used in uh, towards the latter years in DHL, which was Head, Heart, and Guts, which is which is actually that is very good. Um, uh, and but it, but actually, what they've done is take the take the textbook and turn it into a program, which which I think made it work better. So probably there would be three. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe that is all we've got time for. Okay. It is. Thank you both very much. That has been an absolutely fantastic conversation. I think um, all of the audience will agree that they've learned lots um, on both sides. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you both with us. Um, I know that we said we weren't going to have a judicious uh, use of LinkedIn, but please do connect <laughs> um, <laughs> to both Phil and to Che. Um, and show your appreciation there as well. We want to try and build our audience for the in conversations with. Um, I hope you'll agree that it's been as interesting as, as I've certainly found it and that you'll join us for the next one. Watch this space and thanks again, chaps. Thank you, Chair. You're brilliant, mate. Well done. And Happy. thank you. Absolutely. All the, all the questions from everybody as well. There's, there's nothing worse than being left hanging and you didn't let that happen. So absolutely brilliant. And take Amazing. care. Good, luck. Good to spend lunchtime with you. Take care. <laughs> See you. Bye-bye. Thank you.